Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Get Tech Smart where I help you get tech savvy. And today's episode is just as wonderful as all the other episodes. Uh, I have a very fantastic guest here today, a uh, New Hampshire resident, uh, tech startup founder. I mean, he's doing so many great things. Uh, Matt Gurugay, I am so excited to have you here. You are co-founder of a, a software company called uh, Away2. And you're also VP of Marketing and Sales at Echo Behavioral Software Company. I mean, you're just techie all the way around, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let's just, I want to know your story. And I want people to know your story because you literally created your own company based on a necessity of your own. Yeah, right. That's right. What is that? Let's let's tell people what made you create a way to. Oh, absolutely. And thank you so much for having me today. So I can kind of give you a little background of my story. So when I went to college, I went to a small liberal arts school called Wheaton, which is in Norton, Massachusetts, kind of in between Boston and Providence. And the whole time I was there, I was like, I'm gonna be a lawyer. So I majored in English, which is what they tell you to do, minored in philosophy. I go through three years and I hit my junior year and I realize. There's no way I'm going to law school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so I kind of start grasping at straws and I'm getting a little concerned and I tried journalism. So I actually yeah. interned at the New Hampshire Business Review in Manchester, which is a really positive experience, but I also realized journalism <laughs> wasn't for me. <laughs> and so I kind of stumbled into my senior year, petrified about what life after college held for me, really concerned about what I was going to do with this English degree, how I was going to make it all work. Yeah, like most seniors who take English as a degree, like me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No one ever sits you down and just right. says, J just so you know, you're going to major in English. Do you right. have a plan? <laughs> yeah. Uh, particularly when you do have a plan, then the plan kind of falls apart. Yeah. So I end up kind of stumbling into business. What actually happened was one of the people we interviewed was like, hey, why don't you come and do some work for us? And we, we end up kind of starting a marketing company around um, me and my business partner's skill set. So I could write, I could do copywriting, and he was graphic designer so we could do that and we, we did a marketing company right after we graduated for a little while but I kept coming back to this problem and the way I always thought about it was it was pretty clear if you really thought about what I thought a lawyer was going to be and what you learn a lawyer is going to be yeah. that the two weren't the same <laughs> but there was never this moment kind of throughout my entire I guess education where someone sat down and said so do you really understand what it means to be a lawyer is this what what's going to be a fit for you and so we kept coming back to this problem and I think it was even more exacerbated because we were coming out of the liberal arts, and we were seeing all of these incredible, incredibly intelligent students who did all this really cool academic work, not necessarily kind of hit the ground running into the corporate world when it felt like they should have. And so we said, we, we should work on that problem. And our first thought was, well, let's team up with five PhDs and find out what's happening in the world of career guidance. Yeah. And the first thing we noticed was that the interest assessment really hadn't advanced really in 100 years. So there's this guy, John Holland, who invents the Holland Coats, and that's still pretty much the go-to career assessment. Um, and while it, it's reasonably accurate, reasonably predictive, it, it just didn't seem interesting for students. So students didn't like taking it. And we right. wanted to take a new stab at that. What if career education could be fun? So our whole angle was taking kind of a new theory, which was called person-object theory of interest, and saying, what if we built an interest assessment that way? Okay. Yeah. And so now what were the typical questions of the current versus what you built? What, what are some of the assessment questions that weren't really gelling? Yeah, absolutely. So the standard question of a Holland Code assessment is on a scale of one to five, would you enjoy working at a lab uh, bench? And, and, it, and you can imagine trying to ask a 16-year-old right. this. You might like, not understand. No. <laughs> like, well, one, yeah, right. of course not. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> how would I know what a lab bench is? Right. And... Do it just and it's not engaging and because it's roots of it was a lot of questions There just wasn't anything to grab them and then we we had this approach of what if we asked open-ended questions So mm -hmm. what do you enjoy doing in your free time? Oh, yeah, so what do you enjoy doing in your free time? Uh, cooking, okay, <laughs> that, that's perfect. So yeah. then we wrote essentially 4,000 questions So yeah. every hobby has a question. So then we're gonna have this question um, When you're cooking what parts of it do you enjoy? 
Right. And so that, that, that correlates to interest, and then right. that, that prompts your next question. Right, creativity, so, coming up with my own recipe, you know, seeing what I saw on Food Network, and then trying to kind of make it my own. Exactly. That. But yeah. So that, that we would try and grab on, get you to answer that way, and then right. ask you appropriate follow-up questions. Oh, so when you're experimenting with food, how do you like to do that? How do you oh, approach that's it? Good. And so our assessment ends up being much shorter, mm -hmm. but we get through something like 400 data points in 15 minutes. Wow. And that, that ends up being kind of how we come to market. Right. So once the person does the assessment, uh, what type of data is it spitting out? Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna find out a lot about them. So we, we essentially spit out here's all the interests we learned. So those are the named interests, like oh you like experimenting, you like cooking, all the way down to you like very specific things that might relate to a career. And then we're gonna run that through all of the different careers we have. So mm -hmm. about a thousand different careers, and we're gonna match you to here are the careers you would probably like the most or have the highest interest in. By the way, here are also the education paths to do it. And then our last step was here's actually a pathway that you would enjoy the most. One of the concerns we always had is, is you'll find matches where somebody has a really high career match in something, but they might not enjoy the academic work that will get them there. Mm. Yeah. Uh, who, who does, though? Any? <laughs> I think that's any career. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> um, and, but, and certainly across different things, like when you see uh, careers that require like being a doctor, right, many, many yeah. years of education, and then students reporting they don't want to go through that many years of education, yeah. It can be this thing where you would actually really like being a doctor, but you're not going to want to go there. So here are some other careers instead. And so that, that was the last thing we really built out, which is called Pathways, and kind of does all of that calculation. Now, that, that is beyond fascinating. Like, I wish <laughs> this was a, like, it's really funny because, like, we have so many guests that come on. And every time I'm like, where was this when I was in high school? Uh, but this is, like, a fantastic tool. And I, I believe this is something also the, the, the Department of Education uh, uses. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so um, back in, I think it was 2020, the New Hampshire Congress passed a bill called SB 276, and that was called the Drive to 65 Act. And one of the things was they wanted every student entering high school, so either a kind of a rising eighth grader at the very beginning of their freshman year take a career assessment. And, the Department of Education essentially looked around at different career assessments and they were, ended up choosing us. And one of the cool things we did was we then mapped the entire state. So every CTE wow. program that exists in New Hampshire, every career credential you can get, so every licensure, all of that is there in New Hampshire. And then the platform became available to all um, essentially secondary students in New Hampshire. That is fantastic. That, I mean, and I think that is very essential right now. I mean, one of the things I'm noticing in tech uh, and that I talk about a lot with my guests is that, especially in the tech sector, there's going to be a lot of shortages. Um, like cybersecurity, for example, is is one area. Uh, you know, with everybody now working remotely, you know, we're now more dependent on technology. Mm -hmm. So that means we need more IT uh, people, uh, professionals, I should say. Um, so having kids, uh, especially who are interested in tech, for example but they don't know exactly which area, because when you say tech, it, it, it's a big area. It's yeah. like, where do you even start? You know, and sometimes I have people who say, will reach out on LinkedIn and say, hey, can you help me? I'm trying to get into tech. And I'm like, um, okay, do you know like what area? Because that's <laughs> like saying I want to get into medicine and it's like, you know, we, but which area? So this assessment can essentially narrow down uh, specific areas that best align with the student. Exactly, and I actually think you kind of nailed one of the things we really were hoping to do, which is show a student that a career pathway could fit for them that they might not have even heard of. And yeah. we look at that with all the different careers in STEM pretty much across the board. A student who's in the seventh grade might not even be aware that IT security analysis exists, right? Yeah. And then, but how do you try and take something like but I like playing video games, and show them that parts of the things they're doing in video games actually relate to this career. And that, that's what we're trying to do, to show those students, oh, the way that you interact with your hobbies is actually similar to these careers you might never have heard of. And then once you can kind of create that path for them, hopefully get them interested in moving yeah, forward. Yeah, that is absolutely bananas. Now, so we're talking about this at a student level, but mm -hmm. to be honest with you, I feel like as adults, there are some adults, including me, that kind of struggle with, Okay, I went to law school, right? I went mm -hmm. to law school, practiced for a little bit. 
You know, I told you I ended up in, in telecom and in, in a CTO, and then I ended up pivoting, and now I'm like, oh, tech, where have you been all my life? Um, can adults use this? Because I feel like I talk to so many adults who are just not happy with where they are career-wise and always look to pivot, but they don't know where to start. Yeah, and it, it's actually a really interesting problem. It was something we worked on a lot because uh, a lot of our clients were colleges, and colleges have a big adult population, and they're online uh, schools who are, who are kind of facing that problem. And one of the things you find that makes it even harder is if you're talking to a 16-year-old, essentially the world's their oyster. Right. We can line them up with internships. We, they, they can take a couple swings. But then all of a sudden you look at an adult who you know, has a mortgage and really right. has to <laughs> yeah. be moving forward in a career right. path and they can't miss. Right. Like if they're going to take their next swing. And so uh, it, it was a problem we worked on. One of the hardest things uh, to think about there that I think is actually a big opportunity still in the field is transferable skills. Mm. So if you've been a CTO working at a telecom company yeah. and you, you did all of these things for scoping out construction projects, well, actually, now all of a sudden there are all these other careers that those skills are transferable to, but yeah. mapping that out and trying to make it at all comprehensible on an individual level really hasn't been done, but it's something that we were kind of starting to work on, I think, an area. Listen, I tell you, that's an area I would highly recommend uh, that is looked into because I had moments where I'm like, I wish someone would just tell me where I belong. Yeah. Like literally, I've had those conversations with myself. Uh, fortunately, uh, just by you know just researching more tech and just exposing myself to different areas of tech, I feel like okay, I'm kind of honing in. Oh, I like AI, and oh my God, I love cybersecurity. It's crazy in cybersecurity right now. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, that is something. I have conversations with lawyers who are trying to pivot into tech or um, other people who are just, hey, I was, I'm a teacher, but I don't want to teach anymore and I want to pivot into tech, but they don't know where to start. I'm, I'm that right there, if you can get that assessment for adults, uh, that's a gold mine. And since we are on TV, I just want to let people know, if they do come up with that idea, just remember who told <laughs> them about it, okay? I just need a small check. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Although the big joke we always talk about in Cyber World is, you know, there, everybody has ideas. It's execution that's hard. And, yeah. and you look at something like that, and even uh, another example of it is kind of military and trying to take military transferability because yeah. uh, all of the different uh, levels they're in, that's all published. So in theory, you should be able to dissect it and make the transferable skills. But that's another thing that just we haven't been able to do successfully. It's a it's, struggle. I mean, you yeah. bring up something really excellent about transferable skills and, and trying to figure out... Uh, where I can take, you know, my real estate background or my corporate technology operations in telecom and, and, and transfer into a different role. That is a struggle. So even for adults, I think a tool like this is, is critical. I'm happy that it's available for students because, like you said, you know, there is more avail availability for internships and, and just the sky seems to be the limit. When you get to be in your, like, 40s, <clears throat> Okay, you know, you start thinking like, okay, how long do I have left before I can collect Social Security? So you want to pivot quickly. And mm -hmm. like you said, you want to do it right because it's, it's not like you can keep changing every year or every month, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, to follow up on that, so first of all, adults too can take the assessment. So at away to awato.io, you can create a free account and try it. So if you're struggling, we'd recommend that. And to actually talk about how, kind of in the absence of understanding your transferable skills, where we really focused in is to talk about interests. So right. when you think about uh, performance in a career, a lot of the research says that 60% um, of it really comes down to two things. So it's aptitude and interest. But aptitude is really hard to get at. Uh, students don't like taking interest uh, aptitude assessments because they're long and boring. Yeah. Adults also don't like taking aptitude assessments because they're long and boring. So we said, well, what's this other 30% men's interest? And the idea with interest is you see, you, you find somebody who's interested in something. And so they're willing to do it. And so they, they show higher levels of attention, which yeah. actually creates better knowledge structures. So they end up being effectively smarter at it, better at it, which makes them want to do it more. And it creates this kind of loop that we call kind of this um, fortuitous loop of interest where they can just constantly go through it. And this is where when you find people like 
you'll have like a niece or a nephew and they really love art and all they do is art. Well, that's actually kind of the interest thing coming alive. And our yeah. assessment's trying to help you identify those things yeah. because the theory is we try and reflect on what are those moments that you're not looking up at the clock, but you are doing work and then seeing if you can build a career around those. Right, because you like art, and now there's like video game design, and there's a lot of companies now are looking into digital marketing. So you could be a designer for a company doing digital marketing. You know, digital marketing is another side of tech which doesn't require you to be coded. You know, you're actually creating marketing uh, tools for companies. So that, that's, I, 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 that's amazing. I'm like, I can't even find words. It's amazing. but. Going back to a way to, there was a recent acquisition, right? Yeah. So can we talk about that? Absolutely. So just to kind of fill up the picture a little bit, when we came out uh, kind of first to market, we actually were selling in the college market predominantly. And then it was, we had started selling into K through 12 and the Department of Education had approached us and we, we really went into K through 12. And one of the things we learned really quickly was how important the college application process is in mm -hmm. K through 12. Yeah. Uh, and it's actually another one of these things oh. where if you want to talk about an uh, opportunity, because there are so many problems in the college application uh, process in America, it's essentially a paper process that we now try and do through technology. Yeah. So you're talking about like uh, counselors spending all of this time having to go in and re-upload transcripts and send this form to the Common App. And it was something we, we had no experience in, but schools were asking us to do it. And we were saying, well, I don't think we have expertise in this. You know, we wanted to build cool assessments and help people find the career paths and doing you know, workflow automations for uh, college applications just seemed much too large. And so we started looking for a partner to help us kind of grow what we were doing in New Hampshire. And we had reached out to Zello and Zello had been at career guidance since the 90s. And mm -hmm. they had actually first started selling career guidance software on CDs. Um, and they kind of moved forward and then they have a web application which called, was called Career Cruising, which was pretty much the biggest uh, college exploration tool at the time. And then they relaunch and rebrand into something called Zello. And we were kind of astonished with Zello because Zello has so much more breadth than what we were doing. We really focused on just assessment and matching. And Zello is this t total career infrastructure. Everything a student needs K to 12, really, and actually K to 12 to um, kind of explore careers and take the next step. Yeah. And so we were working with them and we were like, this is amazing, Like we're really passionate about this, we're doing this great work, maybe we should come together. And we were working on a partnership and then the economics of the partnership didn't really make sense. And we said, well, wh why don't we bring these two companies together, which is what we decided to do. And I think it was really an excellent fit because it was a lot of people who were passionate about the same idea right. and wanted to bring these things forward. And so if you look at what we're doing in New Hampshire, New Hampshire, a way to is entirely free for schools. But oh, now uh, a lot of the schools use Zello for everything else and the two integrate. So students are able to hop between the two um, and use both platforms. So that was kind of how all that came about. Yeah, so let's let's dig a little bit deeper into that because it's been a while since you know my college uh, application days. Uh, but you're right, you know, we're, we're trying to get away from the paper copy, yeah. you know, uh, and, and make things more digital and, and easier just to do your, like you said, your transcripts and whatever college essays that you need, make it all digital. Uh, so how is, explain the process. So I'm, I'm Flo, the senior at Alvin High School. I'll use, that's our local high school. Absolutely. Um, I'm going in, you know, well, how is it going to be easy for me? Uh, to get my uh, college uh, application packages together. Absolutely. So let, let's assume you have Zell. So you're going to come in. You're going to have a list of schools you want to go to, and there we're going to Harvard. Uh, <laughs> so you have Harvard, uh, <laughs> MIT, Stanford, yeah. of course, um, and some of those are going to be on the Common App. Yeah. So there are about four thousand schools in the U.S. A thousand of them are on the Common App, but they are many of the uh, kind of most applied to schools. So that's going to be really easy for you because you're going to go in. To Zell, you're going to click into the Common App, you're going to pop up into the Common App website, you're going to fill out all of the Common App forms, mm -hmm. and then that's going to apply to all of your schools. No way. That, that are on the Common App. So that's I don't right. have to do it one at a time. 
Well, but that's only for the Common App schools. Oh, okay. So that's 1,000 out of the 4,000. So okay. now you want to apply to some of the schools that aren't Are on the in, Common okay. App. So then you have to add that information in. Okay. Right. So now you go into Zello. You're going to manage that process in Zello, and you're going to pop in. You're going to say, okay, here's the school. And each school now is going to have its own requirements and its own application. Right. Some will require two letters of recommendation. Some will require none. And it, some will have an additional writing prompt. And it's all of these things that you then go one by one, and you pop into the school. You have to upload your forms, upload your forms, upload your forms, request letters of recommendation, do that for every school. That's all going to be managed in Zello where you're going to be able to see the common app schools and all these schools together. Right. But that, that's essentially the process. It's still going to be easier to do because if let's say there is uh, a lot of schools that actually require two recommendation letters, you will already have those letters uploaded. Exactly. Um, so you're, it's going to be just, you know, it's not as difficult as it sounds. It'll be a lot easier because you already have that. Now, so there's a school that's not already in the app. Once I add it, is that school now part of your system? So if another student comes in, will they be, able, let's say Manchester Community College, for example, let's say it wasn't in the app, but then I added it. If another student comes in and they're also looking to apply, will Manchester uh, Community College uh, information pop up? Uh, in theory, but with um, kind of the way Zella works, if you were applying for a school, it was already in the system. So like okay. we have, all of all the, the schools that okay. you're going to be applying to. Okay, that's good. No, I mean, this is fantastic. So so what what do you do now? Are you going to be transitioning out of your role in a way to? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that was kind of what had happened. It was, you know, after the acquisition, we worked on um, kind of getting a way to integrate it into Zello, really landing the team. So almost everyone who worked at a way to at the time still works at Zello, which was, I think, a really big win for both companies. Yes. Uh, and and it's, it's obviously a difficult process. You're bringing together, uh, they're based in Canada, we're based in the US, so cultural things. But we, I think that part went really smoothly. So I spent about six months working on that. And then they asked me, oh, can you build the inside sales team, essentially the business development team, out? And so I took over business development, spent another six months kind of taking that team from two people to eight people. Wow. That was really fun and exciting. And then it kind of felt like I had... I had done what I wanted to there. Like it was a, yeah. a good time for me to say, you know, I, I want to take a step back from what we're what we're doing here and kind of explore other opportunities, but continue to support them. So I'll, I'll uh, continue to kind of help steer a way to, in particular, make sure everything goes smoothly. But I decided to take a step back. While that was happening, um, and this is kind of one of the interesting things about tech and entrepreneurship is you end up meeting so many great people, particularly if you come to a state like New Hampshire. New Hampshire has this kind of unique startup ecosystem where um, because it's a rather small pond, you can very quickly meet most of the people who are uh, yeah. important in it. And so you end up kind of as you get all these mentors and investors in your company uh, with this really powerful network. And one of our investors was the founder of the Echo Group, which is a behavioral health um, EHR, so electronic health record system, and it was that it was one of the first ones. And he had been saying, "Oh, we, you know, you should come and see what we're doing up right. here." They're based in North Conway. I was like, "Well, yeah, all right. Well, yeah. let's go see what we're, what you're doing." And oh, you know, what about sales and marketing here? And I really fell in love with what they're doing. So just to give you a background, let's talk about Echo Behavioral Health. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's dive into it. Um, so now we have to go back a, a few decades uh, as computers are kind of coming together. George Epstein, the founder, is uh, actually helping run a behavioral health um, facility, and, and he's seeing how difficult it is uh, to do that. And so he, he decides he's going to go out and create uh, one of the first computer programs to do it. So he actually is one of the first to market with essentially EHR, electronic health records, being able to sh kind of order medication and take case files all, all on a computer specifically for behavioral health. Uh, and, and now he's been doing that for almost four decades. What ends up happening is, as you can imagine, it starts as a desktop application. Right. Uh, and, and they had a desktop application for a long time, and then uh, they now kind of launched what we're really focusing on, which is called the Echo Vantage, which is our cloud-based solution. And the idea was that we wanted to take everything that we had gotten right with the old uh, application, but really kind of take it into the next level. And one of the big innovations that we're trying to bring forward is to make the electronic health record visual. So now we're going to be in a little bit in the weeds, but it's a tech show. So if you've ever <laughs> looked at electronic health records, if you know, you're in a doctor's office and you just happen to glance at what you're looking for. Yeah. It's just forms and forms and forms. You can't understand what, it, what no one can understand that. <laughs> no, it's, it, it's, it's really intimidating and it's 
uh, it can really slow down the process. If you're yeah. a clinician, you could be clicking and clicking and clicking. And what we've done with Echo Vantage is the idea of what if we make that visual? Mm -hmm. So you say, here's all this information, but what if you take a step back and you could see a timeline or essentially a face shot of your, the person you're treating and you can see, well, how are our interventions helping them? Are they getting better? Are they not getting better? Have we missed an appointment? Do they need a medication refill? And see that all visually at a glance so you're not clicking around. And that's really what we yeah. focus on. And so you have the reporting capabilities. So it's, it's, it's taking the patient's data and make it, and it readable and reportable, right? So if the, if the doctor is walking in, um, you know, and seeing, you know, me, um, it's not a, okay, I gotta go through 100 pages to just figure out where, where you started when you first came in and, and, and where you are today. It's simplifying the whole process uh, and probably decreasing the time doctors need to prep for uh, their visits with patients. Exactly. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. So what areas of behavioral health uh, does the software cover? Yeah, so you're looking predominantly at mental health is what we focus on, but we also do sort of substance abuse, family services, and foster care. Yeah, better record keeping. Yeah. Yeah, it, it makes, I, I know right now, you know, uh, even in, in other areas of, of medicine, there, there's a frustration with uh, record keeping and even patients just re being able to request their, their records. Yeah. And when it's electronic, uh, I think life is a little bit easier. Exactly. And actually, just to even kind of get a little more into the weeds, but kind of educational to think about the field. So in mental health, one of the big things is trying to think about how you move from fee for service, so you come in and you see somebody and you pay for a fee versus kind of outcomes-based treatment, where you're saying, we wanna help people you know, stop, stop committing crimes. We wanna make sure kids don't commit suicide and all that, and then kind of tracking toward outcomes. But as you can imagine, then you need to do all of the special reporting on yeah. those outcomes, which is something we specialize in, is actually outcomes-based reporting. Oh, that's fantastic. And, and yeah. does it give, um, any of the collection, I came into the word, uh, the do I'll just say the doctors. Any of the doctors, does it give them any like alert triggers if someone is like a high risk, for example? Absolutely, yeah. So we generally refer to them as clinicians, which I think is what you That's the one I was for. trying to say. It would not get out. <laughs> I was like, forget it. Uh, yeah, uh, doctors. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it, we do. We, we provide alerts. And that, so, as a perfect example, say you haven't seen um, what we call them clients, uh, maybe in three weeks, but you were supposed to see them in two weeks. We're gonna mm -hmm. send an alert to make sure you reach out. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. And now does the alert just go just to the doctor or can you do an automated alert to uh, the client to say we haven't seen you in a while, uh, can you please call us? Yeah, we also can do that with, uh, we have a client portal. So the client can also get notifications and receive yeah. emails and see those types of things. So, I mean, so everything is kind of going cloud-based, uh, but some people might not really fully understand what it means uh, when you say cloud-based. Uh, you know, it's not a cloud in, in the sky, uh, so just a, a little minor, just real simple explanation of, you know, what, what cloud is. Absolutely. So if you think about just, you have to run an application. It has to run somewhere. So when you run a desktop application, it's running on your actual hardware on your desktop. When um, kind of as the computer age came about, most of the companies would have their own servers on premises. So that's where you get that term on-premise software. You yeah. can think like the big IBM rooms. And now the next kind of phase is the cloud, which essentially means those servers are spread all around the world, all yeah. across the country. They're going to be run by the big companies you would think of, Microsoft, AWS. Uh, Google, yeah. AWS, exactly. And essentially a company like Echo is going to pay them to host our app. So we're going to use their servers. They're going to be more safe, more secure, more affordable. And then you're going to access all of this from your browser, which means we can get way more compute power, way more storage power, all these things. And we can scale up and down. Uh, right. really elastically, which can be really helpful. And, and I'm happy you brought up the, the fact about, you know, it's safe because, you know, obviously there's been a, a lot of uh, uh, data breaches and, you know, security is quite a concern for anyone who's a customer and especially, uh, you know, a health patient. Um, so knowing that your medical files are secure and, and safe is, is very important. Exactly. And security is one of the things I think most companies, most people are starting to think more and more about. And you can yeah. imagine just how much secure it is to have a secure facility, maybe out in Utah, versus uh, you know three servers in the basement where right. somebody can just walk in yeah. and, <laughs> and stick a USB in there. 
Yeah, no, I mean, this is great. So uh, besides echo behavioral health, I mean, is there anything else that you that you're going to work in, in in tech? What's your future in uh, tech? You know, it, it's a good question. I think um, I founded a company once. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm going to found another company again, but not for the foreseeable future. So we're going to focus on Echo. We're going to keep a way to um, really uh, going strong, and then we're going to see what's next from there. So for anyone who's looking to potentially be a tech startup founder, what is the number one tip uh, that you would give them? Yeah, so I think a lot of people will tell you, you, you want to start thinking about the problem. So what problem are you going to focus on? And then immediately start thinking about who that is. So who's going to be your end customer and go spend as much time as you can with them. Just go meet with your customers, understand their needs, talk to them about what you're trying to build and then build alongside your customers. And that's how you're going to find success. No, I think that's a great one. And what about the future of tech in New Hampshire? Because you did mention that we do have this great tech ecosystem that's really growing specifically in Manchester. Um, and one of the reasons why I created this show, I felt like there wasn't that spotlight that we really needed. So I, my mission is to highlight people like yourself and uh, any other tech companies that are out there. Uh, but what do you think is the future of tech in, in New Hampshire? How can we be competitive and potentially be the next you know, Washington or Texas that's seen a humongous tech boom right now and, and California? Yeah, I, I, well, I think there's kind of two parts of this. I think the future for tech in New Hampshire is very bright, and I think there are things we can do to make it brighter. I think when, when I think about what makes New Hampshire really special now is you're looking at all of the reasons you should move to New Hampshire, where else are you going to get mountains, beaches, and lakes all in one place? And so it's, it's a great place to live. There's no income tax. So there are all these good reasons to attract talent here, particularly as we go more remote. Right. I think one of the things that would really help us is high-speed rail to Boston. So really f bringing Manchester and Boston kind of feeling much more like a suburb, I think could really t take us to the next level. Yeah. And do you think higher salaries too? Because I feel like that's one of the things that we tend to struggle with and why we end up losing uh, people across the border. Uh, I, yeah, I think... Uh, <laughs> Show me the money. <laughs> oh, it, it's, it's an interesting question because one of the things we learned as, you know, the pandemic essentially created uh, a national workforce. So you, you're competing against all of those other companies' salaries, whether they work in New Hampshire or not, because they can be hired from a company in California today and live in New Hampshire as well. Yeah. So I think higher salaries is now kind of the name of the game. You have to be matching salaries. You have to be competitive yeah. if you want to attract top talent. Yeah, and, and I think we're, we'll be there. Uh, I think it's one step at a time, one brick at a time, and, and we'll, we'll get there. But, I mean, your, your story is fantastic, and... The tool that you build to help students, uh, you know, <laughs> everywhere, especially right here in New Hampshire, is absolutely phenomenal. So if, if you're a student, even an adult, <laughs> even an adult, because we all need help too, uh, and you pretty much feel like, hey, I don't know who I want to be, uh, there are solutions. There are solutions out there, and you, I, I think it's really breathtaking. And, and I, I might try to play around. Can we? Put, can I play around? Yeah, with well, the I think tool? We, we can get that set yeah, up. Yeah, I think I'm gonna play around with the tool. Uh, but it's been a pleasure having you here. Uh, congratulations on, on all your just fantastic tech achievements and tech successes. I have a feeling you're gonna build another company. So great to have you. You're welcome to come back anytime. And thank you everyone for watching another episode of Get Tech Smart. Stay tuned for more.